Thank you, Dennis, for that lovely introduction. And I hope you don't mind, I'm not going to stand behind the podium or it will be the magic podium talking to you. <laughs> I'm a little short. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go into it and hopefully, at least I gave you a very nice picture to start you with. So I always like to start the talks with why, uh, what is a natural product to begin with. So a natural product or a secondary metabolite is a molecule that is produced by an organism, is not essential for its survival, but it somehow confers some evolutionary advantage for the organism, organism to make it because it takes energy. So if they are making it, there has to have a reason for it. And over 62% of the small molecule agents approved as medicines are, can be traced back to a natural product. So aspirin, for example, is derived from a natural product that comes from a tree. And over 48% of cancer approved drugs come from a natural product. So Taxol, which is the number one used drug for cancer, comes from a tree as well. So because we have uh, profited so much from natural products, and that is just terrestrial, it makes perfect sense that since our oceans cover 70% of this earth, and they contain so much of the biodiversity of this earth, that they were, we're going to find new natural products that we can use as medicines in the ocean. And the other part why it makes sense is that many of the organisms that live in the ocean cannot move. They're sessile. So if you think a little sponge, the way they get a lot of things done is by putting out chemical signals. They put out signals that allow them to mate. They put out signals that allow them to conquer a territory and say, this is mine, to stay away. Um, and they put out signals that say, don't eat me, I taste nasty. Uh, and so by doing that, they allow themselves to survive. And so they're little chemical factories, and of course they have the reasons for making it, but we take advantage of their production, and we use that to find possible new cures. So, and we indeed have had already success. There are two, these are two approved drugs that come from marine organisms. The one on the left here is Jondalis or Ectinocytum743, and it comes from a tunicet uh, that is found in the Caribbean and Mediterranean seas. I'm told that it is also found here in Fort Pierce. Um, and our own Dr. Amy Wright helped find the structure of this compound. So this it was not so simple to solve. <laughs> and it has been approved by the European Commission for the treatment of soft tissue sarcoma and ovarian cancer. And in 2015, it was finally approved by the FDA for soft tissue sarcoma use. Um, Halabin or aribulin is another compound. So this is the synthetic, and that just means the made in the lab uh, product, um, the analog of the marine sponge natural product, Halicondrin B. And this one was approved by the FDA in 2010 to treat metastatic breast cancer in patients that had already gone through two regimes of different chemotherapies. However, in, in Europe, this has become the first line of treatment because they have seen such positive results. So let's hope that it becomes like that here in the US. And unfortunately, everybody always asks me this, we are in the early stages, we do discovery, and there is a very long road from the, from the lab, from my lab to the clinic. So I was showing you actinocytin 743, and uh, that, the one that comes from a tunicate. They first observed activity for this compound in 1969, and that was uh, at uh, the National Cancer Institute, in the National Institutes of Health. It took until 1990 when the structure was re, uh, elucidated. So that was uh, reported by Reinhardt and his colleagues at the University of Illinois, Urbana and Champaign, and by Dr. Amy Wright here at Harrow Branch and her colleagues. It took until 2000 for PharmaMart to report a commercially viable synthesis. So they were able to make it in the lab and they were able to make it in a way that it was compatible with producing a lot and being able to sell it. It took until 2007 for the European Medicines Agencies to approve it for soft tissue sarcoma. And as I said before, it took until 2015 for the FDA to approve it. 
So this is a span of 46 years. Uh, it's longer than I've been alive, and I'm no spring chicken. So, <laughs> so this, is, this tells you that it is a long road. Hopefully, it will not be as long for some of our compounds, um, but it is a long road from the lab to the clinic. And as Dennis said, I'm part of the Marine Biomedical and Biotechnology Research Program here at Harrow Branch Oceanographic Institute. And our goal is to discover marine natural products that can be used against many dreaded diseases. So we hope that this beautiful biodiversity, which we know translates into beautiful chemistry, chemical diversity, we will, we will be able to find cures for Alzheimer's disease, uh, bacterial infections such as MRSA and Clostridium difficile, uh, malaria, tuberculosis, diabetes, and cancer. And today, I'm only going to talk about the cancer because that's what I do. But I just wanted you to be aware that we are also finding cures for other diseases. And of course, there are many scientists that, uh, that are part of the marine biomedical and biotechnology research. So we have a natural products chemistry group, which is led by Dr. Amy Wright, where they isolate and purify the natural compounds. They also do the chemical characterization of the compounds. And they have worldwide collaboration to test against many, many dreaded diseases. We have a microbiology group, which is led by Dr. Peter McCarthy, that does the isolation and culture of marine microorganisms. They also screen for antibiotic activity, such as MRSA. And they have environmental assessments going on on the Indian River Lagoon to see what bacteria are present there. Uh, my group is a cancer cell biology group where we screen for bioactivities, and then we try to figure out how those compounds do those activities, and we call that the mechanism of action. Um, we have a group that is the sponge cell biology group that is led by Dr. Shirley Pomponi. This group is uh, trying to create cell lines that come from sponges to produce the compounds, but also Shirley wants to understand why the sponges make the compounds. We know how they benefit us, but we don't know what benefit they have for the sponge in all cases. And then we have a biosynthesis group. So what Dr. Wojun Wang is trying to do is, that, is to identify the genes that are responsible for making the compounds, and then once you have those, those genes, to perhaps uh, induce production or even change those genes to produce different compounds with different activities, which might be more potent. So I, I know at some point I'm going to toss these terms at you, so I figure I better define them before we start. So these are two key concepts in cell biology. One of them is apoptosis, and the other is signal transduction. And apoptosis stands for programmed cell death. And it is a normal process that all cells have, well, that when they have finished their function, or if they have become infected or damaged in any way, they can commit cell suicide. Um, it is, as I said, it's a normal process. However, in cancer cells, this process sometimes doesn't work. And so a damaged cell or a cell that contains damage in DNA is allowed to survive. And many cancer cells are known to be resistant to apoptosis. So I took this slide from Amy because I thought it was an easy way for us to understand um, how apoptosis occurs. So everybody knows that when you have inflection, you have elevated levels of white blood cells, which are cells of the immune system, because they're there to try to fight that infection. Um, and once those white cells, though, destroy the infectious agent, you have to remove the excess white blood cells because you really don't need to keep them. And so they die through apoptosis. That's the way that they eliminate themselves. Uh, the second concept that I want to introduce you to is signal transduction. And Wikipedia <laughs> uh, defines uh, signal transduction as any process by which a cell converts one stimulus into another. So uh, you push something, and that's going to push something else, and push something else, and that is how it all happens. And cells use what we call signaling cascades, this activation of different molecules, to decide what they're going to do next. They're going to produce growth factors. They're going to divide. They're going to produce new blood vessels or undergo program cell death. They do it through these signaling cascades. And the best way to explain this, again, Amy came up with this, and I think we all can understand this one. So if we were to order a pizza, uh, the delivery guy will get into his car. And if all the traffic signals work, 
where I get our yummy pizza. So this is signal transduction. Everything worked and we got our pizza. However, if the delivery guy gets in his car and then encounters a faulty signal, what's going to happen is a crash and no yummy pizza. So the top one is normal cells. The bottom line is cancer cells. So an easy way to think about this is a normal cell, all signaling pathways work. So all those traffic signs are up, they're working, and so it will only proliferate when it's needed. It can undergo apoptosis, and it only grows in its tissue of origin. Now the cancer cell, we have faulty lights. So the signaling pathways are defective, and this allows this cell to proliferate, uh, to be able to resist apoptosis and to grow on tissues other than where it originated. So now that I introduced that, we're going to start getting into the, the gist of the talk. So I'm going to talk about cancer, and cancer is not a single disease. It's the general name of a group of more than 100 diseases. So there's never going to be one cure for cancer. There are many, many different diseases that are grouped under this term. What they have in common is that cells are in a part of the body are growing out of control or failing to die, and these cells contain damaged DNA. And the, re the way we acquire damaged DNA um, can be through inheritance, exposure to chemicals, viral infections, smoking, excessive sun exposure, and this is what we know as of, as of now. And these are some sobering statistics from the American Cancer Society. Cancer affects 14 million people worldwide with over 8 million deaths annually. And one in three Americans will have some form of cancer during their lifetime. So cancer remains the second leading cause of cancer of death in the US. So it is still a very nasty disease. However, it's not all bad news. So these are some good news. So deaths from cancer in the, in the United States have dropped about 25% since hitting a peak in 1991. And that drop is due to reductions in smoking and also advances in early detection and treatment. And those advances are due to the investment that we have done in cancer research. So just so that you know, it, we are making progress. So another one of the results of having that investment in cancer research is that now we can do what we call personalized or targeted medicine. So when a patient goes and has a biopsy of their tumor, we're able to study that tumor that was extirped, and um, we can see what molecules are in the surface. We call those receptors. And um, based on that, we might be able to more target it give them a treatment that they will respond to. The other thing that we can do is we can sequence their tumor and we can know what genetic mutations they might have. And based on those genetic mutations, we might know a little bit of the signaling pathways that might not be working well in that, pers in that particular patient. So we can then give a patient a more defined tr treatment that is more targeted to his own tumor and his own person. So this is a really big advance that is the result of research. We also have new approaches to treat cancer because we learn more about what's wrong with cancer. We know that in cancer, I was telling you about signal transduction molecules, and we know, or signal transduction, and we know that some of the molecules that do this signal in transduction in cancer are always on or always off. So now we're looking for ways of returning them to normal, turn them off or turn them on, depending on what we need. We know that inflammation seems to precede the development of certain cancers, and we know it facilitates metastasis or the spread to other organs. So again, we can target that more specifically. Uh, we know that tumors create what we call a tumor microenvironment by releasing soluble factors that help them grow. And so we're trying to target that more specifically. Um, an area, I'm an immunologist by training, and so an area that we are really interested in is making your own system recognize it. And what we know is that the cancer kind of becomes invisible to the immune system, and what we're trying to, to make it is so that the, the immune system can see it again. And finally, we know that cancers are able to turn on um, unusual pathways to get nutrients. And so if we were able to uh, block those pathways, we kind of will cut the fuel lines that are uh, facilitating cancer growth. 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit of how we do that or how we're approaching those treatments here at Harbor Branch. So we were very lucky that for many years we have access to our own ship and submersible. And nowadays we have the Corporate Inst Institute of um, Ocean Exploration Research and Technology that allows us to use remote open operated vehicles. But using these tools, we are able to collect marine invertebrates that then we have our fantastic chemistry group extract with solvent. And they do what we call fractionation. So they separate every single peak that you see there. It's a different compound. And our chemists separate it into what we call the peak library, which contains mixtures of two or three compounds. Or we also have our pure compound library. They send those to my group. And then we do the screening, and we do mechanism of action studies. And so just so that you know, <laughs> some of us cannot live without this. I am one of them. So any time that you're making coffee, you're making an extract. So you grab your uh, coffee beans, you ground them, you mix them with hot water, and you obtain this magnificent drink that keeps me going uh, that contains caffeine and a thousand other chemicals. So that extract, that every time that you do, you're making an extract. Those of you that don't drink coffee, you do a similar thing with tea. Um, and so that's what an extract is. Of course, our, chemical, our chemists do not use water. <laughs> They're using different solvents, but they basically grind the samples, with the, mix them with the different solvents, and they obtain what we call extracts from the marine invertebrates that we have. And I told you that we have what we call the peak library. And the reason the peak library is used for a screening is that we get mixtures about three or four uh, compounds, and it allows us to find different activities that could be there. So this is a discodermia sponge, and this contains a compound that some of you might have heard about called discodermolite, which is very similar to taxol and is very toxic. But it also contains two compounds that are not toxic, and by following activity based on the peak library, if we follow those highlighted in green, we will obtain this compound that is able to inhibit IL-8, and the reason we care about IL-8 is one of those soluble factors released by tumors that allows the production of new blood vessels, and this is, inhibits that process without killing the cells. Um, if you follow the yellow, you end up with this other compound that inhibits CCL2, and CCL2 is what we call a chemokine. It attracts certain cells to the side of the tumor that facilitate tumor initiation, and so by blocking that, we block the cells from coming there. So it's, it works out beautifully to use the peak library for screening um, when we do it. And when we do screening, we have two types. We have what we call cytotoxicity screening, and that just simply means can our compounds kill our cancer cells? Of course, we don't, want, we don't just want to kill our cancer cells. We want to kill cancer cells without killing normal cells. This is what we call selectivity. So we have one of our compounds, lidomatolite, kills about 300 cancer cells for each normal cell that it kills, and we like that. We have another one called neopeltolite that kills 6,000 cancer cells for each normal cell that it kills. We like that even better. So that's what we're trying to go for. Um, we also do what we're called target-based phenotypic screening, very big names. Uh, but what that refers to is I've been telling you about signaling and those molecules that do it. What we're focusing is on those molecules. Can we turn them back on or back off using our compounds, or can we block them? So we are trying to figure out if we can do that using this type of screening. This is called forward chemical genetics. We know we're changing a molecule. We don't know exactly why we do it. And that requires to, for us to figure out how we do it, which is what we call mechanism of action. And uh, we use human cancer cell lines. Uh, for those of you that might not know what that is, is when a patient goes and has surgery to have a tumor removed, uh, once we have the tumor out, if they get permission, this tumor is dissociated into single cell suspension and try to grow into the lab. And then it is placed in a repository, so, such as the American Tissue Culture Collection. And so scientists like me can buy those cell lines. And the good news about that is that those cancer cells keep growing and dividing in the lab, so I can keep them for a good time. And they retain the characteristics of the tumor that they came from. So it allows me to study the biology of cancer and also to test cancer treatment in human cells without affecting any patients. So the first project I'm going to talk to you about is breast cancer. And so breast cancer 
uh, is still um, a very prevalent cancer. It's about, it represents about 15% of all cancers and it has about 6.8% of all deaths. But this is one of the cancers where we have made the most progress in terms of survival. So about 90% of patients are surviving five years post-diagnosis. So, and this is mainly in part because of targeted therapies. However, there is one form of breast cancer that still keeps us at bay, and that is what we call triple negative breast cancer. And triple negative breast cancer gets its name because it lacks an estrogen, a progesterone, and an epidermal growth factor two receptors. And so if they had any of these receptors, we would be able to target it. But without this, we don't have any markers to send the medicine right there. Breast cancers are, represent about 12% of, of cancers or breast cancers diagnosed in the U.S., and they're very aggressive. They tend to metastasize, and they go to sites like the brain and the lungs, which we don't like. Um, they are more likely to recur than other cancers. And they also are what we call high-grade tumors, so the cancer cells resemble the normal cells very little. Um, and finding target therapies against this particular disease remains one of our you know, golden gra grails or holy grails that we, we want to find. So the way we're approaching that here at Harbor Branch is by doing what we call 3D culture. So we grow normally our cancer cells in what we call 2D cell culture. And this is growing the cells in a single layer. Um, so this, don't get me wrong, is a very effective thing. It has given us a lot of treatments. But it does limit cell-to-cell -cell interaction as the cell just in, is interacting with its neighbor. There are no nutrient or oxygen gradients present. And there's an extracellular matrix context only here at the bottom where they interact with the plate. If we grow the cells in what we call 3D cell culture, we grow them as little spheroids or little tumors. And these maximizes cell-to-cell -cell interaction. It creates nutrient and oxygen gradients that are present in this culture. And we have very interactions with extracellular matrix as they are happening all over the tumor. And so this method of growing the cells most closely mimics tumors. So what we're doing is what we call a 3D spheroid cytotoxicity assay. And this is Ms. Tara Pitts. She works in my lab. And most of the work that I'm going to show you is thanks to her and her hard work. So thank you, Tara. And this was paid by um, the Save Our Seas um, license plate. It's a pilot project um, by funds from the Bernard A. Egan Foundation that has supported my, project, my program for many, many years. We use two, two kinds of triple negative breast cancer cell lines the MDAMB-231 and the MDAMB-468. And we played them as little spheroids. Then we added media that contain our marine compounds or controls. We incubated them for 48 hours. And then we added media containing different dyes. We had a, a media, a, a substrate of caspase 307, which is uh, one of the uh, signalings for apoptosis. So if apoptosis is occurring, we will get green color. Uh, we have another stain that is red that will only go into cells that have lost their membrane integrity, so cells that are dying. And we have uh, all the cells, we label them with a nuclear stain for being blue, so we can follow them. And we have a machine that is called a high-content imager. This, is, this combines kind of microscopy with being able to count the events of what we're seeing. And I'm going to show you some results. So, so this is what a 3D spheroid looks like. And so this is a, this is a 3D sphere of triple negative breast cancer cells to which I have done nothing. But you can see while most of the cells are alive, the ones in the center of the sphere are undergoing apoptosis. And this is the reason why we wanted to grow them like this, because we know there's different interactions when you grow the cells in this kind of spheroid. But what we wanted to see is can I induce further apoptosis in these cells using our marine natural compounds? And I think, I hope that you will agree with me that indeed we can. And so here you have uh, more apoptosis occurring. We're dissociating more of the spheroids. We actually lost some of the blue cells. And you're starting to, starting to see some of the green. Um, this is another one that I thought was really amazing looking. So you can see apoptosis in the center. You can see more of the dead cells in the exterior. And we can see that we have reduced a lot of the blue cells that were present. And the final one that I'm going to show you is this one because this one is really cool. You are seeing 
early apoptosis in the center, late apoptosis in the outer, and of course you have seriously reduced the number of cells present. So this was really exciting because we are able to induce apoptosis in triple negative breast cancer cells. What we wanted then to do is, okay, are we really finding things that are completely different to what we have tried before to treat breast cancer? And so what I told you was really cool about this machine is that it allows me to quantitate. And so what I did is I labeled the cytotoxicity. So this is based on the red dye. Anything that was higher than 30% got called a hit. Based on the blue dye, anything that decreased the cell number, more than 50% was got a hit. And based on the, red, on the green dye, anything that induced apoptosis was uh, called a hit at 30%. And so, and that is shown in the dark gray, the medium gray, and the light gray that you're seeing here. So all of these samples were hits on the 3D spheroid assay. And then what I did is, okay, if I went and did our traditional way of growing the cells, put the same compounds, would I get the same results? Because it is a lot more expensive and it requires a lot more time to do the spheroid assay. And so what I did is I put um, in green those that would have been hits in the 2D, steroid, like growing them the normal way, and in red, those that would not have been a hit if I grow them um, in 2D. So all the ones in green, I would have found whether I did the spheroid assay or, or grew them the normal way. For all the ones that I put an a, a orange box around them, I would not have found unless I had done this. So these are really uh, substantial hits that require the cells to be growing as a tumor for us to be able to target them. The ones that I put a blue box around, these ones are able to induce apoptosis in these tumor-like cells. And the ones that I'm going to put a gold star on, so that those two uh, fractions contain one, the same compound, and we know that this is a new activity for that marine natural product. So uh, just to show you conclusions here, we identify compounds that are only active against triple negative breast cancer cells when they are growing as spheroids. So it validated that this method of screening is really promising. It is really finding different novel treatments. Um, it identified uh, compounds that are able to induce apoptosis in triple negative breast cancer. Um, we already have a known compound with, for which induction of apoptosis against triple negative breast cancer cells is a new activity. And of course, we have submitted grants to continue this work, so please keep your fingers crossed for me. So the next project that I'm going to talk to you about uh, has to do with pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer has been one of the cancers that we work the most with. Um, even though it doesn't have a very high incidence, it is the fourth leading cause of cancer death in the U.S. And what is very sobering is this statistic. The people surviving five years from the, from after diagnosis is only 8%. So we obviously need better drugs to treat this cancer because we get as pretty much as many new cases as we get deaths. Um, what is very sad about pancreatic cancer is that both the incidence and the lethality of pancreatic cancer are increasing. And so if we are not able to find some better drugs to treat this disease, it is projected to become the second leading cause of cancer death in the U.S. by 2030. So pancreatic cancer is an aggressive cancer. There are no early methods to detect it, which is a challenge. Uh, the tumors are highly metastatic, so that means they spread to other organs. And most of the times, they are, the patients are not diagnosed until the cancer has already metastasized to a different organ. The tumors are resistant to apoptosis and to most cure, current chemotherapies that work through apoptosis. Um, pancreatitis, or inflammation of the pancreas, increases the risk of developing pancreatic cancer. We know that these cancers are able to activate unusual pathways to obtain nutrients, and that also uses its microenvironment to grow. So the way we try to, we're trying to target this is what through cancer immunotherapy. So I told you I'm an immunologist, and we know that at some point, cancer cells become invisible to T cells. So here I made a little cartoon where the T cell is complaining that if the cancer cell doesn't have the, the right receptors, it cannot talk to you. 
And the cancer cell is laughing because it's doing that on purpose. By not putting receptors, it becomes invisible to the T cell and the T cell cannot act upon it. So what we're trying to do is make your own immune system recognize this cancer. So I'm gonna get a little bit into the science, but I'm gonna walk you through it, so <laughs> bear with me. So everybody has heard about antigen presentation, and I should apologize, I'm an immunologist, and we like to give the same cell 500 names. So a cytotoxic T cell is also called a tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. It's also called a CD8 positive T cell. So you might know it by that. It is a lymphocyte, it is part of our white blood cells. Um, but they recognize, when they recognize cells, they can induce apoptosis in those cells. So if a cancer cell is being presented to a cytotoxic T cell, uh, you require that the T cell receptor on that cell to recognize the antigen being presented in context of MHC. If that binding occurs, this is gonna result in the cancer cell undergoing apoptosis. Uh, so immunology is all about uh, homeostasis and keeping balances. And so we have other factors that can play a part here. So we have what we call co-stimulatory molecules, such as B71 and B72 and CD28. And if these bind at the same time that antigen is being presented, you actually get a stronger response. So that we want. However, there are other molecules called immune checkpoint molecules, such as PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4, and B7H4, that if those were to bind at the same time that antigen is being presented, you get a weaker response. So most immunotherapy or one form of immunotherapy that is being used in the clinics is targeting these immune checkpoints. We know that these, if they bind, they cause a weaker response. So the idea was if we were able to block it through an antibody or a small molecule, such, a such as a natural product, could we restore the response and get the cancer cell apoptosis? And this is indeed the case. So I, know, I don't know if some of you have seen the advertisements for this, but these are being used nowadays in the clinic. They have shown very good responses for those cancers that they work on. So there are PDL1 inhibitors such as Decentric, Vavencio, and Infinci. There are PD1 inhibitors such as Keytruda and Obdivo. And there are, uh, there's a CTLA-4 inhibitor called Jerboy. These are effective against certain types of cancers, such as bladder cancer, non-small cell lung carcinoma, the Mersel skin cancer, some melanoma, some kidney cancers. However, they are not effective against pancreatic cancer. And so pancreatic cancer doesn't seem to express a lot of PD-1 or PD-L1. Uh, it doesn't express CTLA-4, but the one immune checkpoint that they do express is B7H4. So we decided, can we target B7H4 using our marine natural products? So again, Tara did most of this work that I'm showing you, about, or showing you here, and this was supported by a grant from, uh, a discretionary grant from the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute Foundation that was made to BMR. And so we played it ourselves. We replaced the media uh, with, marine comp uh, with media containing marine compounds or controls, we incubated for uh, 24 hours, and then we labeled the cells with an antibody against B7H4, a cell mask, or a nuclear stain. We did high content imaging, and I'm gonna show you some of the results. So these are our cancer cells. So these are pancreatic cancer cells. They've been labeled, so the blue is the nuclei. You can see some of the green in some cases, which is just showing us the cell body, but all the red that you see is the B7H4 expression without doing anything to the cells. So you can see how abundantly B7H4 is expressed in these cancer cells. And next, we wanted to treat them with some of our marine natural products and see if we can bring those levels of B7H4. And I hope you agree with me that there's less red in this picture. So we have indeed brought down the levels of B7H4 with this marine natural compound HB149. And we have even others that work even better. So there's a lot less red when we treat with this fraction. So that makes us very exciting because now we can kind of get the immune system recognizing and seeing pancreatic cancer again. 
The other way that we're trying to revive the immune system, and again, I'm going to show you some crazy science. Bear with me here. Uh, so it's targeting the molecule called FOXP3. And so I show you how antigen presentation occurs so that this cytotoxic T cell can recognize the cancer cell and kill it. And if it happens in the process of co-stimulation, we get a stronger response. Because immunology is all about checks and balances, there's another cell called a regulatory T cell. And this cell, um, it has many markers, but one of the markers that it expresses is a molecule called FOXP3. And its job is to make sure that this response doesn't, uh, doesn't stay on forever. So if it sees this response, what it's going to do is block it and stop it from occurring. So regulatory T cells in context of cancer are not what we want. But there's a new finding that we have seen, and it is that pancreatic cancer cells and colon cancer cells, those are the only ones that we know do it so far, express FOXP3. Uh, what we think is happening is that by the cancer cell expressing FOXP3 is fooling the cytotoxic T cell in producing a weak response. And so our idea is if we were able to block FOXP3 with our small molecule, we'll be able to restore the response. And so again, we did an assay using very similar uh, approach, focusing on FOXP3. And these are our results. So now the red that you're seeing is FOXP3 expression. And this is our control. And you can see that without doing anything, we have very abundant uh, FOXP3 expression or pancreatic cancer cells. If I treat them, though, with one of our uh, marine natural compounds, you can see that we indeed brought down the red. So we're very excited about this research uh, because it means that we might be able to restart the immune system. So some conclusions for this part of the, prog of the project is that marine natural compounds that regulate B7H4 have been identified. And these compounds are uh, potential therapeutics not only for pancreatic cancer, but also for colon, breast, and lung cancers. Um, we also have identified marine natural compounds that, that regulate FOXP3, and they can be potential therapeutics against pancreatic cancers and colon cancers. And they might help us understand why cancer cells express FOXP3 to begin with. Um, so again, I have submitted grants, so keep, keep your fingers crossed for me. The last project that I'm gonna to talk to you about has to do with colon and lung cancers. These remain, so lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer death in the United States. Um, colon is still high. Um, and even though we have a lot more survival, this is still a very aggressive cancer. So we're still trying to find cures against dif these different cancers. And so we're focusing on uh, a molecule called surviving. And so you have to excuse me, I did a very nerdy thing and I show, I'm showing you pathways. And this is the pathway for apoptosis. So we've been talking about apoptosis and how it works through signal transduction. But what surviving does is that it's able to inhibit molecules called caspase 9 and caspase 3. And those are essential for apoptosis to occur. So if surviving is there, it will inhibit apoptosis that way. Surviving can also translocate into the mitochondria and inhibit the release of a SMAC Diablo. Uh, SMAC Diablo is its own inhibitor, so it kind of makes itself be present no matter what. But surviving also has other roles. So surviving is essential for the alignment of chromosomes during cell division. And it's also part, as you can see here, of the mitotic spindle. So we have here a molecule that is, blocks apoptosis, facilitates cell division, and it is expressed more abundantly in cancer cells than normal cells. So that to us reads therapeutic target. <laughs> we need to target that, that particular molecule. And so we have a graduate student, Kirsty Turnberg. Uh, Tara is also helping in this project and this is funded by the Florida Department of Health. We're trying to find using the similar approach inhibitors of surviving. And as you can see, surviving here is in the red. We have the nuclei in blue, and you can have, you have right next to it one of our uh, compounds, of marine natural compounds. You can see that it brings down surviving. So we are very, very excited about that. So this project is still ongoing, so we're still in the early stages of the screening. We have identi identified some peak library fractions 
And so our chemists are trying to figure out the structures and the compounds that are responsible for that activity. And these compounds have the potential to be uh, therapeutics for pancreatic, colon, um, breast, and lung cancers. So we're extremely excited about this. So I now have given, bombarded you with so much science. <laughs> and I'm just going to give you, so the next slide. If you remember the next slide, you did good. That's the only thing that you need to remember, OK? So I think that one is an easy one to remember. <laughs> So these, marine, these are some of the marine organisms that contain natural products that might help us fight cancer. And I hope that you are convinced that marine natural products are great and that contain many potential uh, therapies against cancer. And so now I'm winding down, and I just want to, I always get asked this question, so I figure I will try to answer before I get asked this. What can I do to avoid cancer? So unfortunately, we cannot do anything to change our genetics. I keep on telling my mom I wish I, had, I was taller, but it <laughs> doesn't happen. So we cannot do anything for that. But there are certain measures that we can take to try to um, reduce our risk of developing cancer. And these include eating a balanced diet, so a little bit of everything is good. The golden mean that the Greeks used to preach is still was valid. Um, exercising regularly, trying to maintain a healthy weight, Avoiding excessive sun exposure. Some sun is good. It gives us vitamin D. It makes us happy. So go out and get your sun. Just don't get sunburned. <laughs> um, not smoking. And of course, getting regular checkups. And the other question that I always get is, can I help? And you guys can actually help my research. The main thing that you can do is keep our oceans and estuaries clean. I want those organisms that contain those great compounds to still be there by the next time I go collecting. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we preserve their environment and make sure that they're happy where they're living. Uh, you can be a research advocate and please tell others about our research and why it matters because we appreciate that. Um, anytime that you hear that the NIH funding, the National Institute of Health funding is going to be cut, please write to your congressman or to your representative and tell them not to do it. Most researchers, we depend on the grants that we get from them to do the work that we're showing you. Uh, similarly, support the state legislature that funds the Florida Biomedical Program. So similarly, if you hear that that's going to be cut, please write to them and tell them, no, they're doing some good things with that money. <laughs> and of course, you can always make a donation to my program. So I know Amy's not going to like that I'm going to do this. Oh, before I do that, I just want to acknowledge all our funding agencies. So we get funding from the National Institute of Health, National Cancer Institute, the Florida Department of Health, the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute Foundation, the Cooperative Institute for Ocean Exploration Research and Technology allows us to still collect samples. Uh, the Save Our Seas gave us a pilot project. And of course, the Bernard Egan Foundation has been supporting my program, and they have been instrumental in me pursuing new directions. And as Denny says, the Marine Biomedical and Biotechnology Research Program is truly a multidisciplinary collaborative project. So anytime that I'm showing you this, any, any and all of these people are involved in some way in the efforts that you see. And I know, Amy, you didn't want to hear about this, but I'm the only person speaking for BMR this year, so I thought you would like to share the good news. So our director, Dr. Amy Wright, has been named a fellow in the National Academy of Inventors this year. So please <laughs> acknowledge Dr. Wright. And that's the end. With that, I will take any questions. If you have a question, please wait until they come to you with the microphone.